Next up, we have Jake Pomerantz. Uh, Jake is a senior, is a history major, uh, and Jake is going to be taking us to task on a subject we don't often talk about, uh, Wheaton's history. Uh, well, by and large, I think we can all agree Wheaton is a very tolerant place, uh, religiously and otherwise. Uh, Jake is going to help, uh, help set the context for how we got to be where we are. Uh, so please welcome Jake Mark. So after Peter's uh, trip to outer space and the future, I'm going to take us back in time to Wheaton College in the 1920s and 30s. Now, this was a very, very different campus. A very different institution. Not only was it all female, but the sign that there were no African Americans, no Hispanics, no Asian Americans, and very few Jews. Wheaton was about to change drastically, as was the entire world. 
World War II completely changed the culture of this campus. First, the weakened bubble, and it brought a lot of issues of tolerance and social justice to this campus. Another interesting story about this mission to Port Harvard is about World War II. Now, if you see the blacked out legally put that up there, considering his mission is important. But that was a refugee student from Germany. And when we began to shift our methodology to look not only at these emissions report, but the weekly news, we found out that this young woman was a refugee who was accepted through an exchange program in a week. And in her letter to the newspaper, she explicitly stated that she wanted to study the plight of Judaism. So, these two images on the bottom are Chesterfield and Lucky Strike cigarette ads, which is just one of the ways in which we do it. It's very different from that. Um, so, that is taken from an article of the Week News in 1934. And that is 1945. And it's just showing how the overall culture of Wheaton became oriented towards the war effort and to the global affairs that surrounded it. Now, before World War II, Wheaton was a very closed campus. It really was a Wheaton bubble. But when things started to heat up in Europe, people took notice. Faculty, students, administrations, everyone was talking about what was happening in Europe. Students coming from study abroad programs, they were telling their stories about how how tense the situation at the German border was in Czechoslovakia, Austria, were annexed into Germany. And as World War II, as World War II came closer, people started to talk more about tolerance and what their role in the world was, what form of democracy they wanted to participate in, what sort of institution we would the weekly preachers that would come to this campus began to talk about issues of intolerance, such as Reverend Duncan in 1944. Clubs and attitudes of Wheaton College changed dramatically as well. Before, 1931, uh, before 1941, when we entered the war, there was a very active German club on campus. Uh, not surprisingly, once we entered the war, that club kind of sort of out. <laughs> But the whole campus was really involved. SWAP, the Student War Activities Board, raised a tremendous amount of money for that time to aid uh, refugees and people who were displaced in places such as France and Britain. And even professors and administrators were involved in the war effort directly as soldiers. In fact, alums were part of the Women's Auxiliary Corps in every branch of the armed services. And then, towards the end of the war, some very dramatic things started to happen. For one, President Park resigned, who had overseen most of the discriminatory policies during the 30s. And we also had Reverend James Robinson speak at our college. And this was a tremendous occasion for James Robertson, who was an early civil rights activist. And he, in his speech to Wheaton students in the chapel, said that African Americans should be admitted to Wheaton College, and that they would flourish here amongst the other Wheaton students. Clearly, intolerance and discriminatory policies were no longer popular decisions and policies for this college. Students and President Neely didn't think so. In 1945, the students raised $500 from their scholarship. It may not seem a lot, but for the time, that was enough to kickstart this program. And uh, although consistent as the headline it is, it was well intentioned. And it was the first step that our campus took towards being a more open and tolerant place for all races and religions to participate in. 
Similarly, in 1945, uh, in accordance with Massachusetts law, of course, we stopped making a requirement to place your religious identity on your application process. 1945 signaled the shift to a new era of toleration and multicultural diversity. Now, I just want to end by showing our official mission statement. Right there at the end, a community that values a diverse world. Now, why is this important? And why is our history important? Well, any institution needs to have a clear understanding of their history. Why? Because the administrators in the 1930s, they had their own economic difficulties. They have their own issues, and so do we. We're sort of at the tail end of a very deep recession. There are going to be more challenges in this institution in the future. There are going to be more hurdles that we have to face as a college. And clear historical understanding will help us reach and maintain the values we have as an institution.